We actually are in week number three of this four-part series. But for those of you who are really into the church here, you know that we're not just teaching through sermon series. We're actually going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the entire book of Luke. We started it a year and a half ago, and now we find ourselves in Luke chapter 20 as we're studying the life story of Jesus from Luke's perspective. And today as we arrive in number three, this third sermon today, we arrive at a sermon entitled, oddly enough, Herodians and Sadducees. The big thought for today's sermon is relatively simple. It's related to the idea of religion, and it's this. Religion corrupts when focused on the temporal world rather than the coming kingdom. Religion corrupts when focused on the temporal world rather than the coming kingdom. Say it with me, short-term thinking. Say it with me, short-term thinking. Say it again, short-term thinking. Short-term thinking is what gets people into trouble. Short-term thinking. Thinking ahead demonstrates maturity, possibility. My daughter, Scarlett, was five years old. I believe it was five. It could have been six. She's now much older. She's 14. (laughs) But almost 10 years ago, I'll never forget, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I I could hear something on the television upstairs. Our room is downstairs. Their room is upstairs, and I could hear. And so I I went out of my bedroom at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I crept upstairs, and there my tiny little pint-sized Scarlett was sitting in front of the television watching another episode of Sophia the First. Now, who can blame her? We've all been caught into the Netflix death trap at least once in our lives. But one episode after another, my little five-year-old, there she was. And she didn't even act act like she was tired. She saw me. She said, oh, hey, do you want to watch? I'm like, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. And tomorrow you have kindergarten. What are you doing? And in her mind... It was so hard for her to connect the concept of watching this TV show in the middle of the night to being tired for kindergarten the next She couldn't get it. Say it with me, short-term thinking. Say it with me, short-term thinking. When my son was 14 years old, now he's 20, and he's in, in a college, and he's studying ROTC and national security. He's going into the army. He's, a, he's got a great mind on him, and he's going to do great in his future. But when he was 14 years old, he was an idiot, like a big idiot. Like, a, really, he, he, was a, he was not a smart kid. <laughs> so, no, some of you know, because you, um, you knew him, and also you have a 14-year-old boy, right? They're all kind of, I'm just kidding. If you're 14 years old, and uh, God bless you, you'll get out of it soon. Okay, now listen. 14 years old, and he was not doing the best in his grades. And I remember sitting down with him, and I remember sitting with him and saying, okay, you've got to study. And he was going to obey because he has to obey. But I said, don't you understand how important it is for you to do well right now? You're not only preparing an academic um, resume for college, You're also preparing characteristics that will last you the rest of your life. You have to do well at 14. And it was so hard for him to get into his mindset, the idea that what I'm doing at 14 actually matters for the rest of my life. You know why? Because of, say it with me, short-term thinking. Because of short-term thinking. They could only see so far away. Poke. Did somebody say, hmm? How many of you love you some poke? Can I get an amen or raise your hand? Amen. Yeah. How many of you say, I don't know what a poke is? Raise your hand. Oh, you're missing out. You're missing out. Poke. I didn't know either. And then somebody said, you've got to get some poke, Pastor. And I'm like, okay, poke. Sounds good to me, you know? <laughs> Thank you. And there was a poke restaurant on Rainbow. I won't say which one it is because it's... I went up there, and I fell in love with poke. I went, I went there for years, last couple years. And do, you, do y'all remember two years ago when every restaurant doubled their price on everything? How many of you remember that, right? And then they do it every year now? So I, I went back to the place, and they did not raise their prices. I'm like, wow, this is like the only place, poke, that did not raise their price. 
And I'm like, give me a bowl of poke. And they did. They put some rice on the bottom. And then for those who don't know, it's like sushi or like fish. And, and they'll put it right on in a bowl form. And so they're, they're, they go to scoop it. And they used to use a normal size ice cream scoop. And now they used a quarter size ice cream scoop. They went in and, and they scooped two pieces of meat. And I said, could I get another? They said, oh, it'll be extra. And two pieces of meat. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I, I told my friend Michael McConnell, for those who don't know, he's one of our deacons and he's a businessman. I, said, I was telling him about it, complaining about poke. And, um, and he, said, he said, what do they do? I said, well, they decree. He said, oh, man. Classic mistake. For those who don't know, Michael McConnell is a very uh, a wonderful businessman. He said, oh, classic business mistake. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, oftentimes, whenever a restaurant goes into tough times, they will do one of two things. They'll raise the prices, which is what you're supposed to do to pay for the product, or they'll lower the quality or quantity. He said, it's a classic mistake. Those who don't know business often lower the quality or quantity. He said, I guarantee they'll be out of business in 12 months. Sure enough, I never went back and went out of business. Why? Short-term thinking. Say it with me. Short-term thinking. The biggest problem with religious people is short-term thinking. Whether your religion is the modern world and what you can get out of it, we'll call it hedonism or materialism, and all you do is worship now humanity, or whether it be one of the plethora of religions that have been offered to you throughout the ages and you pick one and you think if I do really good to please this deity, then tomorrow things are going to be good for me. But it's still short term thinking. Now, Jesus is dialoguing with the disciples, but more so with the people in the temple. If you don't know the context of the story, I have to set it up. Jesus, if you remember, is in his final week of life here on the, here on the planet. He has left, the Bible says, Galilee. He has arrived in Jerusalem. He went down into the temple. On Sunday, he arrives in Jerusalem. That's called the triumphal entry. On Monday morning, he arrives in the temple, the outside courtyard. If you remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about it. He took a whip and he drove out all the money changers and he drove out all of the religious merchants. Why? Because the area called the Gent uh, court of the Gentiles was designated for rabbis to teach people, both Jews and Gentiles, about God. And so he cleans it out, and on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Jesus spends time teaching people right here, just a few days before they kill him. There he is, teaching. And as he was dialoguing, last week we saw the story of how he began to argue with the Pharisees. And he told a story that the Pharisees were really offended with. And as he told this story, the Pharisees were, were really upset because they're like, I think the story you told is trying to tell us that we're wrong. And Jesus was like, yes. <laughs> now we pick up right in the middle of the story because now there are new people, Herodians, Sadducees, and scribes, who now join forces so that they can argue with Jesus. And that's actually the first point of these three points I want to make today from the passage. Point number one, joining forces. Point number one, joining forces. Look at what it says in verses 19 and 20. It says, and the chief priests and the scribes, the chief priests representing the Sadducees, and the scribes, that's an occupation of those who wrote down the Bible and then taught the Bible, that very hour sought to lay hands on Jesus, but they feared the people. They wanted to take Jesus and arrest him right there, but they were afraid to arrest Jesus because all the people loved Jesus. And they knew that they had spoken, because he had known that, this, that, the, that Jesus had spoken the parable about them. And they watched Jesus and sent spies who pretended to be righteous. That, that by the way, stop right here. That's very clearly the essence of religion. Those who pretend to be righteous. Say, Pastor, I don't want to pretend to be righteous. Friend, righteousness is not gained through your doing good things. Righteousness is gained when you declare, I can't do good things, I need a savior. And the Bible says when Christ died for your sins, he exchanges your sin for his righteousness. We are righteous because of Christ, not because of all the good things we do. But then there are others who want to be self-righteous. They don't need Jesus righteous. 
So in their self-righteousness, they have to pretend to be righteous. That's religion. Look, it goes on. For they knew that Jesus had spoken the parable against them, so they watched and sent spies to pretend to be righteous, and they might seize his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. See, they had a plan. They joined forces, and they had a plan to go and talk to Jesus and pretend to be righteous, pretend to be interested. Also, they could trap Jesus in certain words, and if they could catch him in his words, they would take him and deliver him to the court. And from the court to the Romans. Now, what court are they talking about? This is really important to understand because it's not only about today's sermon, but it's about the next few weeks' sermons as Jesus is going to be sent before the the trial, before he dies. The court that they're referring to here is called the Sanhedrin. Say it to me. Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a, a, like a supreme court of 70 religious people that were made up of political sects as well as um, different religious groups, but all, all of the Jewish faith. And there were 70 of them. And this little stone courthouse actually was inside the inner temple right beside the holy place. And it was led by the chief priest. This is what their idea was. If we can trick Jesus into saying the wrong thing, then we could take him to the Sanhedrin, they'll condemn him, and then the Sanhedrin will turn them over to the Romans, and Jesus will be killed by the Romans. That was their plan. That was their plan. Now, who, when I say their plan, who am I talking about? Sounds like, a, like a, some sort of a, 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 oh, my mind just went blank. Conspiracy theory. And it was a reality. Embarrassed by Jesus' stories, the Pharisees now will align with the Herodians, the Sadducees, the scribes, because they wanted to kill Jesus. Now, you might say, who are all these people that you're talking about? Pharisees and Sadducees, Herodians and scribes, and who are all these people? All right. So to understand that, you need to see this graphic. This graphic will kind of help describe this. It's not just important for today's sermon. A lot of today's sermon is relevant information that is a prerequisite in a lot of ways to understanding where we're going over the next few months of how Jesus gets arrested and killed. There were five groups that I just want to brief you on before we go forward. These are the people that combined their forces. Now, to understand this group, you have to understand where these groups arised and how they, how they came to be. Say, so where, where did they come to be? There are two testaments in the Bible. Does anybody know what the older one is called? Two testaments. Anybody name the, know the name of the older testament? What's it called? The Old Testament. You guys are Bible scholars. That's amazing. There's another one, the second one. It's kind of the newer of the two. Does anybody know the name of the, the newer testament? What's that one called? The, uh, I'm impressed. This is a good class. Okay, the Old Testament and the New Testament, but there's 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's what we call the intertestamental period. During the intertestamental period, a lot of history, a lot of fascinating things go on. You could read about it in the books of the Apocrypha. One of the things that go on is the Greek influence that comes into the land of Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Another thing that goes on is the rise of Hellenism or Greek culture inside of these areas. Another thing that goes on is the rise of the Maccabees, these people who fight back against the Greek authorities. And that's where we get the story of Hanukkah. All of that takes place between the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see? Now, during this time, there are five groups of powerful people who rise up as power in Israel. One of them is the Pharisees. The Pharisees, you've got to understand exactly kind of who they were. were, The word Pharisees means the separated ones. They were more holy than you, and they'll let you know. And they're going to let you know how holy they are by separating from you. Holiness to them is separation, because if they're separate from you, they themselves are inherently holy, and the more they are separated unto themselves, by themselves, to themselves, it makes them far better than any of you, the separated ones. Now, these people were focused on personal piety above all else. They were middle-class businessmen. Sometimes we get the idea that Pharisees were like, um, the Pharisees were like professional priests and pastors and that sort of thing. They really weren't, not most of them. Most of the Pharisees were merchants or businessmen or leaders within the community that had other businesses, but they were very important elders in their local synagogues. 
be like deacons or like some lay pastors might be within our culture and context. And um, they were leader, li- leaders, like I said, of the synagogue system, as opposed to the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the leaders of the temple in Jerusalem. They were the priestly class. They were very wealthy. The, the Pharisees, not so much. They were middle class businessmen who were servants of local synagogues. It'd be like having a giant temple somewhere, and there are little churches all over the area, and the, the Pharisees were the ones in charge of the little churches. Does this make sense? Are you tracking? That's who the Pharisees were as opposed to the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees believed in all of the Old Testament, not just the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. They believed in the prophets. They believed in the Proverbs. They believed in the poetry. They believed in all of the Old Testament. Politically, well, they were a political party, but they were connected to religion highly. And politically, they really did, um, they, they were kind of a minority in that Sanhedrin. Do you remember that Sanhedrin, that group of people that was like the Supreme Court? It'd be like us saying, okay, you've got the Republicans and the Democrats, and one is a minority in Congress versus a majority in Congress. So was it during this time. The Pharisees had a minority inside of the Sanhedrin, but they led a populist movement. Most of the people liked the Pharisees more than they liked the Sadducees, even though there was a smaller population inside of the Sanhedrin. That's all important to come. Now, what was their main job, the Pharisees? Okay. The main job of the Pharisees, their goal was to take the Old Testament and teach common people how to follow the Old Testament. And they made it very applicable. What do I mean applicable? Meaning they spent time thinking, okay, how does this relate to your life today? And that's a good thing to do. That's what we should do as we study the Bible. Ask the question, how do we make the Bible applicable today? The problem with the Pharisees is as they came up with ideas on how to make the Bible applicable, they elevated their ideas to the same level as the law of God. And they commanded that everybody else follow their principles. For example, the Bible says, keep the Sabbath day. They came up with hundreds of little minute ways on how you better keep the Sabbath day or God doesn't like you. So they made it applicable to the point of a heavy burden over all of the people that went to synagogue everywhere. They hated Roman authority. They hated the idea of the Roman government telling them what to do. So in that way, some of you who are a little bit lower and don't like as much government, you would have related to the Pharisees in this way. So we see the Pharisees. Who are the Sadducees? Now, this is important. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were very wealthy. They were very politically connected. They were a smaller group of people, but they were a group of important wealthy people in charge of the temple system inside of, inside of Jerusalem. The Sadducees, by the way, they only believed in the Torah. They didn't believe in the whole Old Testament. They only believed in the first five books of Moses. Say, books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And because they only believed those five, they also did not believe in angels. They did not believe in in demons. They did not believe in the afterlife. They believed that once you died, that was it. That's why they're called sad, you sees. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I promise you'll, you'll remember one thing from church today. <laughs> Some of you are thinking about the football game or are like, what just happened? What? <laughs> sad you see is because they, sad you see, sad you see, they don't believe in the afterlife. Okay. We're going to get more on that in just a moment. These are the people who controlled the populace of the Sanhedrin, meaning there were more seats that were given to the Sadducees than, uh, than the Pharisees. They supported Roman control. Now, let me ask you a question. The Pharisees did not support the Romans, but the Sadducees did. Why do you think the Sadducees liked the Romans in charge? Why do you think? Because they were the elite. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of power. They controlled the temple. As long as there was a status quo that they could keep, they wanted to keep the status quo because of their uh, religious position. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, then there's the Herodians. When I say the word Herodians, what's the aspect of that word that really stands out to you that you already know? What's the part of the word that you already know? What is it? Say it out loud. Herod, Herod yeah. 
So the Herodians were supporters of King Herod. The Herodians were a small but powerful, a very small but loud political force. And they were not about King Jesus. In fact, they did not want a Messiah at all. They were all about Herod for king, Herod for king. They, they wanted to support Herod. They loved Roman authority, even more so than the Sadducees loved Roman authority. And this goes back to the history of why there was a guy named Herod the Great, and he was a, a big leader in the Middle East, and during the fight between uh, Mark Antony and Octavian, uh, if you remember your Roman history, uh, King Herod picked the right side, and when he picked the right side, he was set up as kind of a puppet king, a vassal of the Roman government over the entire region. And he had a lot of followers. It wasn't a huge group, but they were definitely pro-Herod for king, pro-Roman empire, which means they were also pro-taxation. That's going to play into the story here in a minute. Herodians, did they like Roman taxation or not? Yes or no? Herodians, did they like it? Yes or no? Yes. yes. There's a group called the Zealots. The Zealots did not like Roman authority. They were the freedom fighters of their day. They were, oh, their, their statements would have been only submissive to God. Already some of you are like, that's what I would have been. I would have been a, I would have been a zealot during the time. They believed in no government authority. They wanted no government authority at all. It was God and them. That's it. That's it. Back to the great time of the judges where everything was perfect. That was their mindset. Thank you. <laughs> and the zealots were willing to kill and murder and commit acts of terrorism to get what they want. Their, their aspect was violence is necessary and we will kill anybody in charge. They were the terrorists of the day. Um, there was one of Jesus' 12 disciples who ended up, he used to be a zealot before he became a Christian. Um, anybody know the name of this, this one disciple who used to be a zealot before he became, what was his name, what was his name? Simon, some of you know, Simon. So he was a terrorist and Jesus saved him. Isn't it amazing that Jesus can save anybody? Can I get an amen? There's also another one that gets saved later on in the story. Do you remember when Jesus, we're going to see it in a couple weeks, when Jesus is in court and he's about to be killed and Pontius Pilate stands up and says, okay, I get to release one of these two people. Do you want Jesus the teacher or do you want, who was the other guy? Barabbas. And he was known as a what? A zealot, a murderer, a terrorist. And you know what the people called for? Give us Barabbas. He was a zealot. There's another group called the scribes. The scribes were not a political sect like the others. The scribes were an occupation, a job, a historic one that goes back thousands of years. They used to be people who would just write what the king said. In the Jewish community, a scribe was somebody who wrote out the Bible. But by the time of Jesus, they were not just people who copied the scriptures. They were people who taught the scriptures and interpreted the scriptures in the local synagogues. Some of the scribes were Pharisees, yes. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Remember that part? Sometimes they were the same. But there were some scribes who were Sadducees. There were some scribes, very few, who were Herodians. And there were some who likely, secretly, quietly, scribes who were zealots. The big problem with the scribes is they focused on minutia rather than the major laws of God. Jesus says to them later, he says, you strain by swallowing a gnat, but you're willing to swallow a camel. They focus on tiny little things. Next week's sermon is going to talk about how religion loves to focus on tiny little aspects of minutia and forget the great law of God. Now, now that you understand these five groups, what's the point? The point is this. All of them hated each other. You say, wait a second, I don't get it. Political parties who hate each other. I don't, Pastor, tell me what you mean. Because it's hard for me to understand. The, these groups of people, they hated each other. However, when it came to fighting Jesus, what did they do? They all came together, they joined forces so they could take down Jesus. These religious political leaders were threatened by Jesus himself because Jesus was there to upend the entire thing. Why? Because religion is never what he intended. Amen. 
Number one, joining forces. Number two, political allegiance. In the second point, we see one of these groups called the Herodians. They come to ask Jesus a question. Okay, Jesus, with whom do you politically align? Which is a great question. You want to split a religious group. Ask the leader, where does he align politically? And that's what they're wanting to do. And that's what he does. Look at what it says. The Herodians, and they asked him. Now, it doesn't say Herodians in the Gospel of Luke, but in Mark's Gospel, it says this group is called the Herodians. The Herodians. Who did the Herodians support? Who did they want for king? Yeah, I'll say that again. I'll ask it again. Who did the Herodians want for king? Herod. Herod. They wanted Herod for king. They came to Jesus and they said to him, teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. They begin by buttering him up a little bit. Jesus, we know you're great. You're awesome. You're like the best. You're super cool and keen. Now, we have a question. They're setting them up. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Very simple question. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, Jesus has a lot of followers from all these political groups, right? And if he says, yes, pay taxes, then some of these people are going to be like, wait, I thought you were the Messiah. And if he says, don't pay taxes, the other ones are going to be like, hey, wait a second, I thought you were going to restore, you know, peace. So they knew exactly what they were asking to trick Jesus. Jesus, though, brilliantly, look at what Jesus does. Jesus says, show me. Oh, no, no, Jesus says in verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness and said to them, why are you testing me? Show me a denarii. And so they pulled out a coin. Now, I I looked up online to buy an old Roman coin to show you a denarii, and I decided against it. It's more expensive than I thought, so I I have this picture, all right? Plus, you can actually see it. And Jesus holds up the coin and says, okay, fellas, whose whose picture is on, whose image is on the coin? And they said, Caesar. It's Caesar Augustus, to be specific. Octavius, grown up. And he says, okay. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and gives to God the things that are God's. Brilliant response. He said, look, show me a coin. Whose face is on it? Caesar's. Well, if it's Caesar's, give it back to him. What do I care? It's not my face. Who who has a bill in their pocket right now? Anybody have a bill in their pocket? Anybody have a bill in their pocket? You knew you were going to come to church and somebody was going to ask for money. Hey, man, here it (laughs) comes. It's happening right now. Come on up here, Adam, real quick. Adam, ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause. I need you to stand here, too. All right, very good. All right, yeah, yeah, come on up, come on up. Mine as well. We've got the video for 10 o'clock, so. All right, very good, all right. All right, Adam, whose image is on this one dollar? By the way, great job bringing a one dollar bill. This man is smart. He, uh, I don't know what's going to happen to it. Whose image is on this one dollar bill? George Washington. George Washington, right? And then I would say exactly what Jesus said. Therefore, give to George Washington what is his. Give to Washington what belongs to Washington. I don't need it. There's more at stake that's going on here because the image, can I have the bill again? The image that is on here is that of Washington. My question to you is as you look at Adam, whose image is on Adam? Who said it? Somebody, who, who, what did you say? God's image. You know what the Bible says about man? You were created in the image and the likeness of God. In God's image, God created both man and woman. Man and woman, he created you. Jesus is saying, look, this belongs to Washington. Give it to Washington, but you belong to God. Give yourself to God. Give Adam a round of applause as he heads down. Don't you understand what Jesus is attempting to say? He's saying, I don't care about your money. Let me be very clear. You're coming to Southern Hills. Let me be very clear. I don't care about your money. I don't want you to give a dime to this church. I want you to give yourself to God. You say, you can't say that. You say that, the church will shut down. Let me be very clear about this. If every single person in this room stopped giving a dime to this church, the church would still be here. Here's why. Because God wants this church here. He'll figure out a way to tithe it, uh, uh, fund it. That's how he'll figure it out. I'm not here 
to get your money. I'm here to get you to give yourself to God. Religion does the opposite, and you're going to see that at the end of next week's Sunday sermon. Here's the point. You, friend, your image is God's. Give yourself to God. You say, well, what about the question of political allegiance? Jesus doesn't really answer it. He kind of does. Anybody watch football? Any football fans here? Raise your hand. Are you football? All right. Football fan? Very good. All right. Very good. What, what's your team, sir? <laughs> it's like one lady say, like, woo! All right. Nice try, though. Okay. I want you to say it out loud. How many of you, out loud, I want you to say it out loud. How many, in a normal football game, how many teams are on the field? How many teams? Wrong. There are not two teams on the field. I'm going to try one more time. How many teams are on the field, normal football game? How many teams? There you go. Three. Some, who said three? Who's the third team? The refs. And the refs have their own allegiance, don't they? To whoever paid the most. I'm just kidding. Oh, that's not. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm so upset about yesterday. Let's go. (laughs) Yep, all right. Okay. To whom are the refs aligned? See, the one team wants to beat the other team. The other team wants to beat the one team. They all want to beat each other. There's one team in the middle. They don't care really who wins. They genuinely are not supposed to care who wins. They don't care who wins. Their allegiance is to one thing, the book. And whatever the book says is what they're about. They're there representing a different kingdom, a bigger kingdom, a bigger kingdom that is the entire organization of football. Do you see? Christians, understand if you're a follower of Christ, You may have a secondary allegiance to a country like the United States. Thank God for the United States. I love the United States. It is definitely my second favorite kingdom. You may even have a tertiary or third allegiance to some political party. Good for you. That's nice. They might be most representative of what the book says. But your allegiance is to another kingdom, and what you focus on is the book. And if either team goes against the book, then you point out, hey, you're against the book. That's what a Christian does. Do you understand? And that's what Jesus was doing. So number one, we see in this passage, joining forces. Number two, we see in this passage, political allegiance. Number three in this passage, we see, what would they focus on? The future kingdom. Number three, the future kingdom. Where everybody else was focused on the temporary world, Jesus wanted to break their mindsets and have them focus on the future kingdom of God. And that's what he does in the next question. The Herodians sit down, and now it's the Sadducees. Look at what it says in verse 27. And then some of the Sadducees, they deny the resurrection. They deny the afterlife, which makes them... (laughs) Can you help me out here, folks? The last group of people that asked Jesus a question was the Sadducees who deny the afterlife, which makes them Sadducees. Thank you. We have guests, you know? <laughs> like, try to, you know, keep up. It's embarrassing. <laughs> they were sad, you see, who denied the resurrection. They came to Jesus and said to him, saying, teacher, Moses, remember, these are the wealthy people, uh, politically connected, the elite of Jerusalem in charge of the entire temple system, and they do not believe in the afterlife. Teacher, Moses, wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, why why do they talk about Moses here? Because they only believe in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible written by Moses. Yeah? Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies... Having a wife, he dies without children. His brother should take his wife and raise them up offspring for his brother. Now, that might seem culturally odd to you, but it's what they did back then. Understand, in the days of antiquity, women and children were not cared for as we attempt to do today. And so if a woman's husband died and she didn't have any children, oftentimes the society would just throw away the woman as useless and worthless and she could not have an income. She needed children, if she was widowed, to be risen up so they could take care of their mother, you see? 
And so the Israeli answer to this, God's answer in the Torah was, do not allow that woman to go hungry, take care of her. And so if a, man, if a, woman di- uh, a woman's husband dies, then her brother needs to also marry her and raise up children. This also solved the land question about who inherits the land of Israel. Now, so their question says, having a wife, he dies without children. His brother should take up his wife and raise up offspring for his brother, verse 29. And there were seven brothers. Where's this going? And the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as a wife, and he died without children. Then the third took her as a wife, and in like manner, the seven also, they all married her, died, and left no children. Last of all, the woman dies. Therefore, in the afterlife, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. Do you see, they don't believe in the afterlife. They think they've got this perfectly tricky question. Who is he married to in the next world? And, and I can imagine Jesus saying, okay, let me get this straight. I've got a picture of what this might have looked like. Let's show the picture of what this might have looked like. <laughs> By the way, how many of you going into that relationship, you're like, I don't want to be the seventh brother. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I want to follow the Bible, but this is truly fishy, right? <laughs> All six of my brothers died, and here you are. She's over there, like, mixing a drink together. <laughs> Don't marry that woman, dude. Do not marry that woman. But nonetheless, it was the law back then. Okay, now. So Jesus, they asked Jesus this question. When we get to the afterlife, when we get to the kingdom of God that you believe in, Jesus, (laughs) who is she married to? And I love Jesus' answer. His answer is, you have no idea what you're talking about. It's amazing how many religious people have no idea what they're talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about. Look look at what Jesus goes on to say specifically to this question. By the way, some of you, while while you heard this, this idea, well, look, look, look what it says, look what it says. Jesus answered and said to them, sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. The sons of this age, people in this age, they get married. But those who are counted worthy to attain the next age or the kingdom that is to come and the resurrection from the dead, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage. There is no marriage in heaven. (laughs) So that's super awkward for all of us. Especially the husband, wherever he is. (laughs) She's like, oh, thank God. Moving on. (laughs) Verse 36. Nor can they die anymore. For they are equal equal to the angels and the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. See, here's the idea. In the kingdom of heaven, the future kingdom, there's no funerals. There's no weddings. It's different. People don't die. People don't get married. That's not how it works. It's a completely... See, the problem with religion is that we like to classify everything in the coming kingdom as it relates to what we know in this world. And so Jesus says from the very beginning, you have no idea what you're talking about. That's not how the kingdom works. But Jesus wants to make a further point, and that is, there is an afterlife you need to be thinking about. The big problem that these individuals had was they genuinely lived for today because they did not believe in the world to come. And so Jesus has to make a point to wake them up to realize this is not the only world. So he says to the Sadducees, even Moses showed in his burning bush passage that the dead are raised up. There is an afterlife. Jesus says, even Moses talked about the afterlife. By the way, why does Jesus go to Moses to make his point? Why? Because they only believe in the Torah. 
So it says even Moses, whenever he was talking at the burning bush, talked about the afterlife. And I'm sure all of the Sadducees are like, really? When did he talk about the afterlife? And Jesus quotes and says, when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, for all live to him. Now, now, some of you may have not caught the rationale between, behind Jesus' argument. Jesus says, so, you think there is no afterlife. Correct. But Moses said, years, hundreds of years after Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were dead, Moses said, I follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why didn't he say, I follow the God that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob used to follow? Because they're alive. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus' point is Moses actually believed that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive and that God was still their God in the afterlife. Jesus' rationale and logical argument was locked in and solid. And his point was, oh, my dear friend, if you... If you're not preparing for that world, you are wasting your life. Each of these groups had their lives so entangled with this present world that they never thought about the coming kingdom. That's the problem with religion. Whether religion you follow is some modern, humanistic, materialistic, uh, deistic version of the way the world... Or whether or not you pick some traditional... Religion focuses you on the minutia of the moment rather than the kingdom to come. I sat with, last Sunday, last Sunday afternoon I sat with a young man named Dennis. Dennis is 27. He wanted to meet with me, and I said, sure, let's, let's, let's talk. And he said this to me. He said, Pastor, I'm 27. And he looked across the eye, he looked me square in the eyes, and he said, the last five to six weeks, my mind has just been opened. Everything that I have been living for is the opposite of what I need to be living for. This world is not all there is. We are to be living for the next world. I said, exactly. He said, I feel like I've wasted so much time. He said it at 27, 27. Some of you are realizing that now. We talked about five-year-olds. And how when a five-year-old can grasp the idea that if I go to bed now, kindergarten is going to be a lot more fun in the morning. When a five-year-old gets it, that's maturity because they are not stuck in short-term mindset. When a high schooler can get it in their mind, what I do now matters at 14 because it sets out a course for my rest of my life. Man, we call that maturity. When you're 25 years old, this has happened to a lot of you, you wake up. And you look around and you're like, wait a second, wait a second, I'm 25. And you notice people in their 20s and especially their 30s that are doing very well. And you begin to put two and two together and you realize those who are doing well in their 30s, they were really focused in their 20s. And you realize the short-term thinking of your mindset has to change if you're going to enjoy your 40s. And then when you're in your 40s, which I am at this point, You're beginning to detail out the specific plans. What does it look like by 60 and 62 and 65? Because I want to be in a place where I'm not only healthy but financially secure enough to be ready for 65 to 85. And you realize wisdom kills short-term thinking. And Jesus takes it to a whole new level by saying, yeah, so, got some news There's more to come after retirement. And some of us 
have started to rearrange our entire lives around the idea of the kingdom that is to come. Application? Like, what does this mean for you today? Today is not a here's three things go home and do. Today I want your mind to be shaken with the idea, is my life working toward the future kingdom or is it wrapped up in the minutia of this present world? Let's pray. Father, the religions of this world are so short-term thinking but a relationship with you gives us insight into your kingdom, the kingdom that is to come. And oh God in heaven, I pray that every man and woman and teenager who heard this sermon today would begin to determine that their lives would focus upon the next kingdom, not this temporary world that keeps going through the same problems it's always been. Help us, Father, to be kingdom men and kingdom women. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for watching the Southern Hills YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we make a new video. And remember, we exist to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Have a great week. Peace.